everyone, and welcome to our Liberty Protection Safeguards webinar with um, Ben Troke, who is a partner in our health and care practice. Um, the webinar will be finished by 2.45, so that's approximately 30 minutes for the presentation, and then about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I just want to check that the, all the technology is working, so if you are able, pardon me, if you are able to uh, find the hands up button, do you mind just clicking on that to uh, confirm that everyone can can hear and see the uh, presentation. Okay, that's going up quite steadily. That's good news for everyone. Um, and just so you know, during the presentation, if you if you come up with any questions, please um, answer them and um, ask them in the question box. And Ben will try and answer them when he's when he's finished. Um, okay, so I'll hand over to Ben Truck. Thank you. Um, happy October, everybody, the 1st of October, and one year to go until the implementation of the Liberty Protection Safeguards. Um, if you've heard me talk about uh, this topic before, you'll know that I was um, surprised uh, that Parliament found time to uh, work on some legislation dealing with reforming the deprivation of liberty uh, system, no matter how great the need, given everything else that's been going on uh, in Parliament over the last year or so. But we do now have legislation. We know the gov uh, government intends that it be implemented one year today. And so it seemed a good time to take stock of what we know about the new system, what we don't know, and uh, hopefully when we are going to find out um, what's going to fill in those gaps. So the need for reform is very well known, and I won't spend uh, a lot of time on this. Um, to comply with Article 5, the right to liberty of the European Convention of Human Rights, we just need an appropriate due legal process to protect the rights of people who are um, deprived of their liberty within the health and social care system. What we got following the European Court of Human Rights judgment in Bournewood uh, was called the Deprivation of Liberty Safeguards, DOLS. They only applied in care homes and hospitals and were often felt to be overly complex or bureaucratic or alternatively woefully underfunded and especially so after the judgment in Cheshire West in March 2014, which gave for the first time a clear definition from the Supreme Court of the meaning of deprivation of liberty and brought huge numbers of people within that interpretation um, and therefore in need of the safeguards. What we've seen of course since then, as anyone working in this field would know, is long delays in getting DOLS authorizations processed, a backlog um, in the tens if not hundreds of thousands of people. Alongside that, because DOLS only applies in care homes and hospitals, um, if you are deprived of your liberty in the community, in your own home, for instance, or in supported living, that doll can only be authorised by an application to the Court of Protection. Uh, and again, there, the demand vastly outstrips the resource of the court to process those cases. And the inevitable consequence has been a widespread, um, uh, unauthorised deprivation of liberty in huge numbers of cases. The Law Commission spent a long time looking at this and consulting widely and produced some recommendations back in 2017, um, which it described as uh, proposals for the liberty protection safeguards. The government's legislation has used the same title, um, but um, there are lots and lots of differences between the Law Commission's proposals and the government's legislation. The draft bill was introduced in July last year, 2018. As I say, it's used the label Liberty Protection Safeguards, but be careful not to confuse it with the Law Commission's proposals that use the same name. As a policy approach, the intention is to spread responsibility, not just leaving the entire burden on local authorities, as it currently is as the supervisory body under Doles, but to involve hospitals, where we're dealing with hospital inpatient circumstances, CCGs, where they're the appropriate commissioner, and in some cases, care homes, uh, where that's the scene of a deprivation of liberty. 
the policy intention is to build the liberty protection safeguards process into the care planning itself to stop it being an afterthought to authorize the deprivation of liberty as a separate um, process after the care planning and all the arrangements have already been put in place um, the intention is to take that duplication out of the system and to make much more use of um, equivalent assessments when the evidence we need to examine and authorize the doll is already available from the care planning process it should be used where appropriate and the hope was for much more flexibility so a doll's authorization would only apply to a particular care home um, and a change of setting would mean a fresh application. The policy also hoped that care homes could be treated as different, as, as special. And a lot of the um, thinking was that care homes will have already done lots of the work that the safeguards need. So we'll talk a little bit about the special status of care homes and their potential greater responsibility for the process. The element of independent scrutiny under the Dole system that came from best interest assessors, BIAs. Um, BIAs don't exist in the liberty protection safeguards, though a little later I'll come on to um, how BIAs are likely to effectively be rebadged into the new role there is, which is called the approved mental capacity practitioner, the AMCP, um, clearly very closely modelled on the AMP equivalent under the Mental Health Act. There are crucial differences between the AMCP role in the Liberty Protection Safeguards and the BIA role under DOLS. And one of them is that under DOLS, a BIA is available for every case, albeit eventually, given the backlog at the moment. Under LPS, the independent scrutiny of an AMCP will only be available for certain categories uh, of patient or service user, most notably those who are objecting to their care. So the independent scrutiny is, is rationed or focused, depending on your point of view. The interface with the Mental Health Act has always been um, a challenging area, and that's just not been tackled um, at all by the draft legislation. And I put in red, in the first draft of this legislation, it was intended to only apply over the age of 18. In response to um, arguments as the bill went through Parliament, lots of government amendments were made. One of the most significant, uh, significant is that point about the age range uh, that the scheme will cover. It's now... Um, the case that 16 and 17 year olds will fall within the liberty protection safeguards, um, though the government kicked it off in Parliament as over 18s only. Um, that is particularly significant because just last week we got a Supreme Court judgment uh, in case of D versus Birmingham City Council, which confirmed that parental consent for a 16 or 17 year old who is otherwise deprived of their liberty is not enough to authorise it. It's not enough to take that doll for a 16 or 17 year old outside the scope of Article 5. It still needs a due legal process. It's not enough to rely on a parent's consent. That means that the cases of 16 and 17 year olds will need to use the Liberty Protection Safeguard scheme when it's in place next year, rather than simply relying on parents consenting uh, to say, we don't need to worry about it as a doll. Other amendments included uh, changing the language of unsound mind uh, to the language of mental disorder, um, making it clear that the consultation, which I'll get to in a minute, must include consultation with the patient themselves. And there was a, um, a bit of debate about whether or not there should be a statutory definition of doll. Um, there was not in the first draft of the legislation. Later, the government um, agreed to try to draft a statutory definition. To, so to define within the legislation, what a deprivation of liberty is but it was so contentious as it went through parliament uh, that the government later dropped that idea in common with quite a few of the stickier more controversial bits of the lps um, that is now going to be left to the code of practice when we see it it's fair to say that the legislation has had a mixed reception um, across the health and social care 
landscape. Care England, when the bill was going through Parliament, um, published something on behalf of 200 uh, independent sector providers of health and social care, expressing significant concerns, pushing the government to go back towards the Law Commission's proposals. Um, the Law Society uh, are not known to be a particularly radical bunch, but were quite outspoken um, about their concerns about the legislation, um, describing it as not fit for purpose in its current form, pushing for revisions. But the legislation went through Parliament, largely unchanged, other than the things I've already mentioned, uh, and it received royal assent in the middle of May this year. We've had a letter from the government saying it's intended to be implemented from the 1st of October 2020, one year today. Um, I've been asked if it's likely that date will slip. Um, honestly, I don't know, and I think much will depend on the process of those other things I've said on that slide that we are still waiting for. So we are expecting five or six sets of regulations that sit underneath the legislation dealing with some of the nuts and bolts for the way it will work in, uh, in practice and how it will be implemented. Um, we need a code of practice, as I say, some of the thornier issues as the uh, legislation was argued through Parliament um, were dealt with by saying this will be covered in the code of practice. Now, working backwards, if the whole scheme will be enforced from the 1st of October, you want the code of practice and the regulations finalised at least six months earlier to allow time for training, um, preparation for implementation. Um, if that's all going to be ready by the 1st of April, then to allow time for a three month consultation and some time to think about whatever the consultation says and do something about it, um, I think we've got to be hoping to have the code of practice by New Year um, at the very latest. Um, and that's what I'm told is expected at the moment. Um, but we will see, and already it's cutting it very fine for all the flesh to be put on the bones in April for a scheme that's going to be implemented in October because the budgets for most organisations for next year are being set now um, and there's still a lot of speculation and a lot of gaps about exactly what the implications will be, particularly for organisations which will have new roles like CCGs uh, and acute hospital trusts. To give an overview of the legislation, over the next couple of slides, I've just picked out some of the headline most significant changes. We will have the liberty protection safeguards. Doles will be entirely abolished and replaced, though I'll come back to a little later the transition from one scheme to the next. So the Mental Capacity Act Schedule A1, Schedule 1A that contain the Doles scheme at the moment will be abolished. Instead, we get a new Schedule AA1. That new scheme, the Liberty Protection Safeguards, will apply to all settings. It won't matter where the patient or the service user is, not just limited to care homes and hospitals. It will apply over the age of 16, which is important. The urgent authorizations that you could use under the DOLS scheme, so a care home or a hospital as the managing authority could effectively authorize itself for seven days, extendable to 14. Um, in exceptional circumstances, alongside the application for a standard authorization, which would run to up, uh, for up to a year. The urgent authorization has no equivalent under the Liberty Protection Safeguards, and I'll explain in a minute what is proposed instead. <clears throat> and the idea is that the assessments that are used under the scheme will be more streamlined, more efficient. This is all about the balance between um, safeguards, procedural protections, scrutiny on the one hand for a very vulnerable group of people and on the other hand cost effectiveness. To achieve cost effectiveness in particular longer authorizations are allowed under the LPS scheme so you will be able to authorize a deprivation of liberty initially for up to 12 months, renewable for 12 12 months, but then renewable for up to three years. The burden of authorization will be spread. It won't just be on local authorities alone anymore. Care homes may have a significant role to play in the process and alongside local authorities, CCGs and hospitals in appropriate cases will become responsible bodies authorizing a deprivation of liberty. And as I mentioned in the uh, AMCP 
role where there is independent scrutiny, the equivalent of the BIA in the current Dole system, it's more focused on a group, a subset of the cases, not for everyone. But it's important to say some very important elements of the system won't change from what we're used to. Most fundamentally, because there is no statutory definition of deprivation of liberty, subject to what we see in the code of practice as, as guidance for how it should be interpreted um, in practice, we are still working with the Cheshire West Supreme Court definition. If someone is deprived of their liberty today under the Supreme Court definition, they will still be deprived of their liberty um, on the 1st of October next year within the LPS. The right to appeal against any authorisation is a hugely important element um, Section 21A of the Mental Capacity Act provided the right to appeal to the Court of Protection against any Dole's authorisation. That will now be in Section 21ZA of the revised Mental Capacity Act, um, incorporating the Liberty Protection Safeguards, but it amounts to the same thing. And two things, crucially, because the scheme will include those outside care homes and hospitals, it will be much broader and there will be a large, uh, a much larger group of people within the LPS. And their right to appeal for that larger group than currently um, is supported through Doles will retain non-means tested legal aid. And because of that, the Section 21A um, volume of cases that go through the Court of Protection at the moment is likely to increase a lot. And that's a very big part of the work that we all do um, in this context. One thing that won't change as well is the Mental Health Act interface. Uh, the problems of that have just not been tackled. Um, if you are ineligible for DOLS because of Mental Health Act issues today, it will still be the same on the 1st of October next year. IMCAS are independent mental capacity advocates. They will still be a big part of the new scheme. An IMCA will be available as of right to any patient who does not have an appropriate person in the opinion of the responsible body to represent them in the LPS process. And even if there is an appropriate person, that appropriate person also has a right to an IMCA. And remember again that LPS will include not just everyone in care homes and hospitals, but everybody deprived of their liberty in the community. It's likely that the demand on IMCAs will increase substantially. Now, this is the bit where the liberty protection safeguards amend section 4B of the Mental Capacity Act to deal with situations of um, emergency vital acts, life-sustaining medical treatment. And what this amendment means is that you are allowed to deprive someone of their liberty in those circumstances, as long as you reasonably think they lack capacity for the relevant decisions that are relevant to the intervention that you are proposing, and you are on your way through the LPS process, you've started an authorization, or a court of protection decision is being sought, or alternatively, even if you're not doing those things because it's not reasonably practicable to have started either of those processes, it's an emergency. Now, here we are going to have to wait and see, I hope, a lot of very helpful guidance from the Code of Practice because it's going to be interesting and important in practice to see how we interpret life-sustaining treatment, vital act, emergency. That provision effectively means there's no need for the equivalent of an urgent authorization under DOLS. But one of the questions I hope the Code of Practice will help us answer is how to reconcile that provision, which says it's okay in an emergency to deprive someone of their liberty, where it's a life-sustaining treatment, a vital act in an emergency, how does that square with the Court of Appeal judgment in Ferreira, which some of you may know dealt with somebody receiving life-saving treatment in intensive care, and the court held that they were not deprived of their liberty at all 
in a way that engages Article 5. There is going to be a real challenge um, to understand how the Ferreira judgment applies in practice in hospitals and how it works alongside that revised Section 4B. Uh, and I'm afraid for now, all I can say is I, I hope that the Code of Practice helps us with that. I imagine some case law um, quite early doors will have to tackle that as well. <clears throat> so, putting aside the emergency situations, this is an overview of the standard approach to an authorization. Um, when a deprivation of liberty is identified, the responsible body has to figure out whether there is an appropriate person to support um, P through the process, and if not, or to support the appropriate person, uh, an IMCA gets appointed. There are three assessments, which I'll explain in a second. There's a process of consultation, which is the responsibility of the responsible body. There's then a pre-authorization review of the assessments and of the consultation, and then there's authorization by the responsible body. And after all of that, with an authorization in place, there is a right to challenge the equivalent of Section 21A of the Mental Capacity Act. So effectively, we have a four stage process of assessments, consultation, pre-authorization review, and then authorization by the responsible body. Um, and that is set out in this flow chart, which I will not read you through uh, right now, but is there. So it's in the slides with the Department of Health emphasizing that this is a draft um, and still a working draft. So. One of the key questions is who is the responsible body? Now, this is a process of elimination. If the doll is of a NHS hospital inpatient, it is the hospital trust that is the responsible body. If that's not the case, you ask the next question. Is it a doll for a care package that is mainly through the provision of CHC? If so, it is the clinical commissioning group that is the responsible body. Pausing there, I think mainly through the provision of CHC is unnecessarily potentially confusing. You are either CHC, continuing healthcare funded, or you are not. And as I understand it, this is to be interpreted literally. If you are eligible for CHC, and that's the funding for your care package that is a doll, then the CCG is the responsible body. If it is a joint package of care and the CCG is paying the majority, then it is still the local authority responsible body because it is not CHC. Even to the point of if it's a section 117, so a jointly funded health and social care package, but the CCG pays 100% of the section 117 package, it still falls to the local authority as the responsible body because it is not CHC. And if it's not the hospital and it's not the CCG according to those rules, then it is the local authority that is the responsible body in all other cases. The three conditions of authorization under the liberty protection safeguards are assurance to the responsible body that he has a mental disorder, that they lack capacity for the relevant decisions about care and residence, and that the doll is necessary and proportionate. Don't forget that we are still dealing with the Mental Capacity Act and the patient's own rights under the Mental Capacity Act. So clearly the care still needs to be in their best interests by reference to the Mental Capacity Act. And personally, I'd prefer it if best interests were still part of the language there instead of only necessary and proportionate, but it must still be um, part of the basis of it. Looking at the assessments, um, who has to carry them out? Um, it says it's by someone who appears to the responsible body to have appropriate experience and knowledge but who is independent of any involvement in the day-to-day -day provision of care. We're encouraged to rely on equivalent assessments when we've got the evidence already about mental capacity for the relevant decisions or about mental disorder. We cannot rely on an equivalent assessment for the necessary and proportionate question. And because of anxiety about the potential conflicts of interest where it's a care home case, those assessments cannot be done by someone with a proscribed connection to a care home. We won't know exactly what that means until we see the regulations. Again, we're waiting for the regulations, but the hint I've had is that the medical assessment to confirm a mental disorder 
um, could be done by any doctor or a psychologist, but we're waiting to see that confirmed. We don't know what qualifications are going to be necessary for the people doing the assessments of capacity and whether the doll is necessary and proportionate. In parallel, I think, it's not entirely clear which comes first, but I think in parallel with the assessments, consultation has to take place and the responsible body needs to be satisfied that there has been an appropriate consultation and there's a great long list of people who need to be consulted um, before the deprivation of liberty can be authorised. It's just like the list of people who need consulted under Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act for a best interest decision. Not entirely clear who has to do the consultation, whether it's the responsible body itself or the assessors or someone else. Um, I'm waiting for the regulations and the code of practice. Having done the assessments and the consultation, the next step is a pre-authorisation review. The responsible body needs to be satisfied that a pre-authorisation review has been done. And there are two ways it can be done, either by an AMCP or not. An AMCP will only do the pre-authorisation review if someone is objecting to the care home and residence. Uh, sorry, to the care and the residence or if the placement is in an independent hospital, or if it's a case that has been referred by the responsible body to the AMCP. I think the crucial category there is about objection. And what do we mean by objection? It's expected that the AMCPs are going to be effectively the group of people who are already BIAs. Um, how they will re-qualify, we're waiting to see the regulations, um, I suspect it will be a training course of a few days. But the role is quite different. Under DOLS, the BIAs get involved in the assessments. They consider, um, as the frontline assessor, whether the person is deprived of their liberty, whether it is in their best interests. In the liberty protection safeguards, they come in later at the pre-authorization review stage after the assessments have already been done. And only for cases, unless it's an independent hospital, where the person is objecting. An AMCP is expected to do this um, exercise face to face, to talk to some of the people who've been consulted, to talk to the patient. If it's not an AMCP pre-authorization review, if it's not an objection case, it'll be a desktop exercise. And who will be doing that if it's not an AMCP pre-authorization review? Um, we don't really know yet. We're waiting for the guidance in the code of practice or perhaps in the regulations. But whether or not objection is identified will make a real difference to the amount of scrutiny given. The fourth stage following the pre-authorization review is authorization by the responsible body. Who will do this? We don't know. We are waiting to see anything in the regulations or the code of practice. Um, likewise, what level of training will they have to have? Um, at the moment, the steer is that it's going to be up to each responsible body, whether that's the local authority, the CCG, the hospital, to decide who will ultimately be the authoriser. Question I've been asked, can it be the same person doing the authorisation as did the pre-authorisation review? Um, I don't know the regulations are, are going to rule that out. Um, the legislation doesn't rule that out. And I know at least in local authorities, it's very likely that it will be the same person, person doing the pre-authorisation review and the authorisation itself. So let's walk through the process in the context of a hospital inpatient deprivation of liberty. So a case where we've decided that Ferreira does not apply to mean it's no doll at all. And we're not using Section 4B emergency life-saving treatment to mean it's a doll that we don't need to use the LPS for. The trust will be the responsible body which means the hospital trust will need to arrange the consultation with P and with others, the assessments, any appropriate person, any IMCA, any AMCP. We'll need to arrange the pre-authorization review by an AMCP if it's an objection case and will then need to authorize the deprivation of liberty. That looks like quite a lot of um, work to be done within an acute hospital trust, depending how many cases there will be, 
which depends on how wide the interpretation and application is going to be of the Ferreira judgment in practice. Two things, I suppose, come to mind. Firstly, the administration of all of that. Um, I suspect if you are an acute physical healthcare NHS trust, you will end up building um, an admin support function that looks a bit like the Mental Health Act team of a mental health trust to deal with that admin. Um, and secondly, um, I genuinely don't know how it is intended that will work for an NHS hospital to deal with considering and authorising a planned admission. So going through all of those steps for someone who is still at home in the community instead of already in an acute inpatient bed. In the community, liberty protection safeguards will apply in your own home in supported living in tenancies um, in the way that Dole's does not. And it's good news that a deprivation of liberty in the community can be dealt with by the same scheme instead of having to go to the court of protection. But how will it work in practice? Um, at least in a care home case or a hospital case, you've got one clear provider. You might well have one clear commissioner. It's easy to imagine a doll in the community case where you've got a joint package or you've got self-funders and you've got a patchwork of different providers, each contributing to a dom care package. Um, it might be more of a challenge in those circumstances to make sure people's rights uh, are met. The role of care homes was very controversial as the legislation went through Parliament and we are left with something of a fudge. Instead of putting lots of responsibility automatically onto care home managers where it is a care home case, instead CCGs and local authorities where they are the responsible body for a care home placement package that is a doll that needs to be authorised can choose whether or not to delegate to a care home manager in a particular case but only if the patient is over 18 years of age so 16 and 17 year olds within LPS will still have to be um, authorised by the CCG or the local authority directly without delegating all of the legwork to the care home manager. In a case that is delegated to a care home manager, this is the list of things that the care home manager will have to do. Identify if there's a doll, identify if there's an objection to trigger the independent scrutiny of the AMCP as appropriate, commissioning the assessors who know exactly what they're doing but have got no connection with the care home that might suggest a conflict of interest. Decide if an IMCA's required, arrange the pre-authorization review, that list of people to uh, have a consultation with, drafting the authorization to go in front of the local authority, or it could be the CCG to sign it off, and then draft a witness statement saying it's done all of this stuff. It looks like an awful lot of work for a care home manager, and the idea that this is just reusing for this purpose stuff that they will all be doing already anyway, as part of routine planning, looks a little optimistic to me. Two things, the responsibility for signing off the doll ultimately still sits with the local authority or the CCG rather than the care home manager. And secondly, to the extent that care home managers do take on any of these um, roles, I suspect we will see the costs of it passed back to those who are commissioning those placements. If it's a care home placement that is not delegated for all of that legwork to be done by the care home manager, then the local authority or a CCG, if it's CHC funded, will need to take the same steps that we went through when it's a hospital trust case. Duration and renewal, I've mentioned this already. Um, there's an expectation that there can be longer authorizations under the LPS, um, at least on the second renewal, up to three years on the second uh, renewal. And variation portability is an important aspect in getting the balance right between safeguards and protection and the effective use of resources. Dolls were seen as too rigid, only applying to a particular care home. The idea here is that if there is a, um, a foreseeable plan involving care in different settings, perhaps in a residential placement, maybe a move from one care home to another, maybe a planned admission to hospital, maybe some respite care, a single care plan can authorise all those different settings and be used flexibly 
for one patient without having to apply again from scratch every time. But you can't rely on that too widely. And if the care package and the circumstances of, of the residents change too much, it's important that you start the process again in order to give them the proper protection of their Article 5 rights. So the authorizations should have more flex in them than dolls do, but don't stretch them too far. Transition. On the 1st of October next year, there will be people who already have a dolls authorization in place or their doll in the community is authorized by a court of protection order. And that dolls authorization or that court order will endure, continue to be valid until it lapses. But once it lapses, after the 1st of October, you can't make a fresh application to dolls anymore. And the court will not expect you to come back to court to renew the court order. You will be expected to use the Liberty Protection Safeguards process that is in place from the 1st of October. So effectively, there might be up to one year of overlap where we've got dolls authorizations or COP orders in place in parallel with new applications being made under the Liberty Protection Safeguards. Crucial question will be if a referral has been made to the DOL scheme but not yet processed by the 1st of October next year, will the regulations provide that we can treat it as a referral to the LPS or will we effectively have to tear up all those application forms and start from scratch under the new scheme? And for now, we just don't know. Let me run through a few obvious issues that are coming up in, in discussions time and time again in the training that we're doing um, about this case and then I'll just take a minute to read through um, some of the questions that have come in and deal with the ones that I can um, just before the end of the session. The challenge about conflicts of interest and the extent of independent scrutiny of a doll under the new system will be a recurring theme um, and we will have to come back to how the responsible bodies will demonstrate um, that the way it is implemented um, is not tainted by any conflict of interest. When hospitals are authorising cases for inpatients in their care, CCGs for packages that they commission, in some ways just the same as local authorities always have as the supervisory body under doles, but even so. For hospital inpatients, how many dole cases will there be in light of the Ferreira judgment and how widely should that be interpreted? Where do you draw what I call the Ferreira line where we stop saying it's not a doll at all because of the Ferreira judgment and we start to need um, to satisfy Article 5 using dolls for now or the liberty protection safeguards next year? Likewise, for commissioners in the community, how many cases do we think there are going to be? Um, and in particular for CHC, commissioners. Because of the significance of identifying an objection, I think defining and identifying that um, is going to be a significant issue. And again, I hope we get some, some good guidance in the code of practice. What will we do about the backlog? For CCGs and for hospital trusts in particular, there's a challenge of preparing for new roles. Now, I know that CCGs when they were PCTs, had the supervisory body role under DOLS, um, but that was abolished in 2013. And a lot of that organisational expertise and knowledge, I think, has now been lost. I've made the point already about the, uh, the need to have resources in place for this system in next financial year, even though we might not find out the details until April, which is a real challenge. Um, there's lots of reliance on the capacity, resource, the expertise, um, I dare say, integrity of care homes and their managers. And the workforce piece of this planning is a huge issue. Who will be the assessors, the pre-authorisation reviewers, if they're not AMCPs? Who will be the authorisers? Um, how will AMCPs be retrained from BIAs? Um, how will all that work? Will there be enough of them? Um, is the funding in place? Um, a huge piece of work. Um, will any savings be realised, which I know was the, the hope of the reforms? So what now? Um, implementation is one year today 
1st of October 2020. Before then, hopefully by New Year, we will see a Liberty Protection Safeguards Code of Practice alongside at the same time the whole Mental Capacity overall a Mental Capacity Act Code of Practice is being reviewed as well. I will hope they I hope they will come out for consultation side by side so uh, we can make sure that they do hang together. We hope that they and the regulations under the LPS will all be finalised by spring to allow plenty of time um, before the October implementation date. Um, the next line, I'm afraid, is little more than a platitude um, to prepare for reform and work together across health and social care economies and communities, local authorities, hospitals, care providers and CCGs. Um, there is no problem you face individually that um, your neighbours don't have as well. Um, and it's a very good idea, whether it's training, whether it's policies, whether it's resources and structures and systems, um, for you to be putting your heads together now. In the meantime, it's not OK to say we will wait till next year um, before we do anything about implementing this. And it's not OK to say we will wait till next year and we've got a new system to do anything about authorising a doll for which you are responsible now. You have to use the doll system that we have. You have to use the Court of Protection for now. And the most fundamental message I always try and get across in training um, on this topic is not to get so hung up on deprivation of liberty and any reform to the legal framework as to lose sight that the most important thing is to be using the Mental Capacity Act itself well and effectively. Uh, and that's the single best thing you can do uh, to stay out of trouble. Now, if you bear with me a second, I will just have a read through the questions and I will either answer them where I can or I will um, say I'll deal with them in a Q&A case. Uh, sorry, Q&A document follow. In relation to objection, I am asked, who can object? Um, I don't know that the, uh, the, the legislation is very clear on this. It might be we see more in the regulations. Um, I certainly hope the code of practice will help us to understand who the objection needs to be made by, whether it can be made on behalf of um, the patient or it must be them themselves. Um, what it is that must be objected to, whether it's an element of the care package or the whole thing or where they live, um, how strongly that objection has to be manifested, how consistently and for how long. Um, I think all of those are variables when it comes to interpreting objection. I would hope we will have a generous erring on the side of caution to the interpretation of objection because it's going to make a real difference to how much scrutiny um, people get through the system. I'm asked, if an LPS involves three services, an acute trust, the ambulance service and a community trust, who would lead on the LPS? Um, the answer to that is the legislation says if the deprivation of liberty is occurring mainly as an NHS acute inpatient, then it's the hospital. Um, anywhere else, it's the CCG, if it's a CHC commissioned package, or it's the local authority by default. So to the, the answer to that question is there's no scenario in which it's the ambulance service or the community trust. Um, it will be the hospital trust if it's an inpatient doll. Otherwise, it will be the CCG if it's a CHC package or the local authority. Should the care plan start with a capacity assessment um, that the patient uh, in that does the patient consent to their care plan? Um, yes, capacity to make the relevant decisions is always the starting point and only where there's a lack of capacity to make the relevant decisions do we get to best interest decisions and then through that to the legal framework that's required to protect people's rights to liberty however well-intentioned our best interest decision making. So yes, very much the point I finished with, don't lose sight of the Mental Capacity Act in getting this right. Is there likely to be a time frame to urgent and emergency situations? There's nothing in the legislation. Um, I can only hope that there will be some guidance, perhaps some case studies uh, in the uh, code of practice uh, that might help us uh, with that. Um, Ask for clarification on the responsible body for Section 117 aftercare. 
the responsible body is the local authority, even if the package has a higher funding from health on a joint funded package. Correct. Whether it's a joint funded package, whatever the share, or a section 117 package, whatever the share, it will be the local authority because CCGs will be the responsible body only if it is a CHC package. Can the care home manager refuse the delegated task from the local authority? I believe so, but I haven't yet seen the small print in the regulations um, or the code of practice about how that will work in practice. Um, this is an important one. Is there still an RPR or a paid RPR role under liberty protection safeguards? That's the purpose of the appropriate person that I mentioned. Um, an IMCA, if there is no appropriate person and the appropriate person themselves uh, can be supported by an IMCA. We've said we'll finish at 2.45 and that's where we are. Um, I do have a lot more questions up on the screen, but I'll try and group those together into topics and themes and I'll deal with them as best I can um, in a Q&A document, which we'll send out afterwards. If you'd like to drop me a line, my contact details uh, I hope are on your screen. I'd be really pleased to hear from you um, what you think about this, how it's going to work uh, in practice. Uh, and if we can offer any support, please do get in touch. Thank you.